Uh, thanks, Sydney. Uh, first of all, the talk that I'm giving today is going to um, orchestrate several different projects occurring on carbon stream by geochemistry here at Harvard Forest. I'd like to acknowledge co-authors. Uh, first of all, Every Boost is the one who's kind of uh, jump-started the hydrology program here. I'd also like to introduce Eric Hall and Lee McAllister, if they could just raise their hands. Lee's a professor at Virginia Commonwealth, and Eric's a graduate student who's worked uh, in the system the last couple of years. And I'd also like to um, acknowledge Jim Sayers, who's a hydrologist at Yale. If you can raise his hand, there he is. Um, and then I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Sarah Mitchell, who's a geomorphologist at Holy Cross College, and she just had a baby two weeks ago, so she cannot be here. And then Henry Wilson, who's been extremely instrumental in the efforts here, a postdoc at Yale University with Pete Brannon and Jim Sayers, whose uh, wife just had a baby a week ago, so he also cannot be here. Um, but it's been a great team to work with. First of all, in the last couple of years since LTR5 was uh, written, or LTO4, there's been growing uh, understanding of the global carbon cycle. And a component that was underestimated historically was the role of freshwater ecosystems. And I don't have time to go into the logic and the quantification behind this, but there's a great paper in Nature in 2009 in which there was a carbon budget for the global carbon budget that added freshwater ecosystems. And the premise is, is that freshwater ecosystems are important hotspots for the metabolism of terrestrial-derived organic carbon to the atmosphere and important conduits for terrestrial-derived carbon to the world's oceans. And we can think of that simplistically for the Harvard Forest watersheds in this conceptual model here. Instead of thinking about carbon acquisition as being gross primary production and respiration, just the traditional forest carbon budget, you can also add in the aquatic components, and that's loss to the atmosphere from uh, metabolism within aquatic ecosystems. I'll make a case today that these are hot spots for carbon metabolism. Sedimentation might be of a role. We have no data on that here at Prospect Hill. But transport or downstream transport of organic material might be another lost term in bounding the carbon budget at the watershed level and then ultimately at the global level. The most influential paper in this area is by John Cole in 2007, and it's a great conceptual model to introduce this uh, area of research here at the Harvard Forest Symposium. We can quibble over the numbers what terrestrial net ecosystem production is, but one number that's hard to quibble over is the amount of organic carbon that makes it to the world's oceans. It's one of the best bounded terms in the total carbon um, cycle, and if we say that's one pentagram, and we assume that the world's streams, rivers, and aquatic ecosystems are not at all reactive, they're just simple pipes, we also then have to assume that one pentagram goes into that pipe. What I want to make a case today is, and it's really supported very strongly in the literature, is that streams and rivers and freshwater ecosystems are hot spots for carbon metabolism. There's lots of CO2 evasion, potentially storage, and if that's the case, this term underestimates the term that went into the pipe. And the pipe term might be maybe double that, two pentagrams of carbon. So this is a very loose conceptual model. It's motivated lots of research. I'm going to make a case today that we're poised here at Harvard Force to quantify the role of freshwater ecosystems in terrestrial carbon cycling because we have the right data sets and the right scale to do that at. Okay, and I'll fly through these first couple slides because uh, Emory introduced these earlier. This is a, a slide put together by Brian Hall that puts Harvard Forest Prospect Hill Tract into the context of a major watershed to the Quabbin Reservoir. And I'm going to refer to that today, and it's the east branch of the Swift River watershed. And I'm going to talk on two scales today, that of the Prospect Hill Tract of Bigelow Brook and of that of the east branch Swift River. This is the east branch Swift River in the context of the Harvard Forest Bigelow Brook Track. It's uh, 18 kilometers from here to the Quabbin Reservoir. I only know one person who's walked the distance of that, and that's Eric Hall. And uh, I'd like to propose maybe we could pick a weekend in the fall of this year and actually put together a group to do that. Um, one thing that I want to highlight in this is we're going to talk about small streams at Harvard Forest, but this is not a stream river continuum. It's really a stream wetland, stream wetland, river wetland, wetland river continuum. In that regard, we need to be thinking as a community 
how carbon cycling is occurring in both streams, wetlands, and rivers. If you want to understand how terrestrial carbon is being processed on its route down to the Klopin Reservoir. Okay, we're fortunate to have great long-term uh, data sets. This is another way of looking at the data that Emory presented. This is discharge from 1938 on the east branch of the Swift River over months. And we're fortunate we have one, the long-term data set, but two, incredible variation seasonally in discharge, which enables us to give lots of cool <coughs> questions for how carbon may be processed at certain times of the year very effectively, and other times maybe less effectively. So a challenge in understanding carbon retention, carbon flux, and carbon metabolism in these systems. And I want to emphasize the hurricane, like Emory said, you can see it's the largest discharge event. I also want to highlight that we have high discharge in the spring, low discharge in the summer, and then variable discharge in the fall, which is very interesting because that coincides when we have lots of litter inputs. And I want to highlight that with discharge from the last two years. So this is taking a 25-year mean for discharge on the east branch of the Swift River and then highlighting that with the blue line, which is discharge from the last two years. And this highlights in a different way of what Emory said, in that the fall of 2009 was a very wet fall, lots of leaf input, maybe high discharge. The previous fall, or this most recent fall, was a drought condition, a time in which the streams and wetlands of the area would have high residence time and low discharge. And it just highlights some of the fascinating facets of the hydrology of Harvard Forest in the region for thinking about variation in carbon storage, metabolism, and flux. And a data set that we have at our fingertips to use for lots of cool questions. Okay, Emory introduced this slide. I just want to add two features to it. One new data set that I'll not be talking about was a data set put together by Jim Sayers, Peter Raymond, and Henry Wilson at Yale, and that was two deep water or deep groundwater wells that have been in place for the last year. And it's the first time we have these kind of deep groundwater base flow estimates of basic chemistry. The other thing I want to emphasize in the slides I show, because it doesn't show up on this uh, map, is that when we talk about the headwater streams of Harvard Force, I want to put in everyone's head, we're talking about a small headwater stream going through a forested catchment, then going through a wetland, and then going back into a stream. And for the talk today, I'll refer to this as Upper Bigelow and Lower Bigelow. Keep in mind that Lower Bigelow passes through a beaver wetland. One of the things we documented in Upper Bigelow a couple years back was that the system has these pulses of organic matter in solution and also has pulses of carbon dioxide. This blue line represents the carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere. And this shows that the system's routinely supersaturated, regardless of season, but has these noticeable pulses. And these high pulses here are associated with fall storm events. Lots of coarse particular organic matter, lots of soil materials moving into the system. So we immediately wanted to say, why do we see this type of variation? Can we make relationships between basic stream chemistry and watershed hydrology? And that's really what the rest of the talk today is about. <coughs> This is work by Henry Wilson, the postdoc with Jim Sayers and uh, Pete Raymond, and he's documented great relationships between dissolved organic carbon concentrations and discharge. We have discharge at that <coughs> upper Bigelow, the forested stream site. See variation, storm events, variation, storm events, and the blue is concentrations of dissolved organic carbon. The take home message, when storm events occur, you have high discharge, you also have high concentrations of DOC. It's an additive effect, meaning storm events magnify the carbon pulses or carbon loss in the system. This is that uh, downstream of the wetland. Notice the differences in the hydrograph. Not quite as dramatic. You're still seeing the storm events, but you see a much more muted pulsing of the dissolved organic carbon in higher concentrations over time. So we have a nice system just on our property for comparing pre and post wetland in a headwater stream system. This is some of the best data that uh, Henry's collected. It shows during a storm event that we have peak in discharge coinciding with rapid increases in dissolved organic carbon concentration, suggesting that it's immediate inputs into the stream of DOC or dissolved organic carbon. And he also used the lability assay looking at respiration over time back at the lab at Yale and notice the peak at that same time. High discharge, high concentrations of dissolved <coughs> organic carbon coinciding 
potentially with elevated lability or bioavailability. And he did this for a series of storms. I can't believe he's still married. Most of these storms usually occur on Saturday evenings at Harvard Force. <laughs> and uh, he's trajected DOC concentration over discharge during these storm events using uh, periodic sampling over time. This is an amazing data set. It's a very unusual data set. And I'm not going to say anything more than there seems to be differences in the relationship with season, with the slopes being different in the summer and the fall, suggesting different sources of organic matter during these times of the year. This is a really rich slide, so but that's all I'm going to say about it now. So that's Henry Wilson's work at Yale. Uh, briefly, I want to talk about some of the challenges of trying to segregate storm flow and base flow. We've identified storms are important, they're hard to chase. This is just an estimate of storm flow discharge just downstream of the Beaver wetland. Probably 41%, maybe 50%. It's a major component of the discharge. We don't think of storms being that regular, but it's important when we think of the pulse of materials downstream from Harvard Forest. So I'm going to add other layers of the carbon cycle. <clears throat> Interesting, POC does not increase with discharge. This is particular organic carbon. But it does correlate with suspended sediments. And this is work of Sarah Mitchell, a ge geomorphologist at Holy Cross. And we interpret this data as saying that the POC is not coming from upland flow, but it's from sediments being resuspended and providing fresh POC during storm events. But at some point, there's a dilution factor that the resuspension of the sediments isn't adding additional POC. We also have looked at coarse particular organic matter export. It's work being done with Jonathan Jones, a student in my laboratory, had a poster here today. Jonathan's collected coarse particulate organic matter, both at Harvard Forest and at the East Branch of Swift River. He's been a very dedicated student. He collected leaf packs uh, two weeks ago. He basically forego, he preferred, or gave up his uh, spring break to work on stream ecology. Um, and I'm gonna present some of the decomposition data here. So DOC export, POC export, and, and uh, it's, of course, particular organic matter export. You see variable decomp in different species. And I just want to highlight that this is about 35% over 90 days upstream and about 25 or 20% downstream of the wetland over 90 days. Okay. In close, I want to talk about Eric Hall's research. He's measured mobility from the headwaters of the east branch of the Swift River to the uh, Quabbin. <coughs> He's marked the percentages varying over three different sampling periods, September, March, and May, ranging from about 4 to 12%. And he's defending his masters, well, there he's over there, sorry, defending his masters this spring. And he's made some of these relationships in regards to carbon quality and mobility. Okay, and then finally, I want to highlight uh, Jim, uh, Jim Sayre's work, in which he's developing watershed model to try to make explicit relationships between discharge and VOC concentrations. And the conceptual model is built on water storage in the system. And using Henry's model, he adds a different term, and that's trying to understand the difference of input and output and the storage in the system. And can you relate changes in storage to changes in discharge and VOC concentrations? And I'll jump to his conclusions. And that is he's modeling DOC concentrations based simply on a simple hydrologic model. And we believe this has great promise, not for just this system, but for extending it to other forested watersheds. And in close, uh, we see nice future research here at Harvard Force coupling carbon cycling in terrestrial ecosystems and aquatic ecosystems. And we think we have a great system here, a model ecosystem, a proving ground of sorts in which we have nice data sets emerging for lots of different types of processes that would affect carbon metabolism and flux. And we're starting to have long-term data sets that might really put us in a nice position to really bound the carbon cycle at a small spatial scale here at Harvard Force. So I'll close there. is coming from forest soils. 
and that which accounts for the continuous pulse of DOC regardless of storm event. We initially thought, well, eventually the tea bag of DOC would start to dilute and run out, and it, it doesn't. So we think that that is the main major pulse. I mean, in terms of the, the large storm events. Soil derived DOC. Often soils, not the Correct. Okay, so our final speaker.